Joining me now is, on set, is Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy. How are you? It's nice good to, to be here. You. Nice to meet you in person. We've had a, we've had a podcast, but... It's good Likewise, to yeah. Right. Let me start with that very question, yeah. which is, can you make... How do you make a case to a Trump voter who loves Donald Trump, yep. believes he's been a positive impact for the party? How do you tell that person, yeah, we know he's running, but you should vote for me instead? So I'm doing what Trump set up to do in 2015, but my commitment to those voters is I'm going to take that same America First agenda and actually take it even further, but also unify the country in the process. What I tell audiences in Iowa and New Hampshire is I'm all for putting America first, but to put America first, we have to rediscover what America is. And Chuck, I think that that starts a conversation about what are the principles that set this nation into motion? And then when we talk about the policies against that backdrop, what I tell these voters is that just like Ronald Reagan did in 1980, mm -hmm. I can actually go further than Donald Trump in getting it done if we do so with moral authority. But I'll tell you that. It's interesting you say this with the issue. It sounds like what you said is Donald Trump failed to unite the country. So yes. no matter how successful you may think his policies are, the failure to unite the country means his agenda failed? That's right. I don't think most Republicans want a national divorce. I think most people, most Americans, including Republicans in this country, want a national revival. Mm -hmm. And I think that many conservatives are hungry for walking the walk when it comes to family values, when it comes to reviving a faith in God. And I'll tell you, from my perspective, I was raised in a stable two-parent household. Mm -hmm. I'm in a stable two-parent household now mm -hmm. with two children. We put family values in there. God and belief in faith in God mm -hmm. is important to us. And I think that when you're walking on that level of moral foundation and moral authority, you can actually go further than Trump did. What do I say? We're going to fire the next time a bureaucrat reaches beyond their constitutionally ordained scope. You actually got to do what a president's constitutionally empowered to do. You can fire them. The president is empowered mm -hmm. to shut down government agencies. Things that Trump talked about but didn't exactly get quite to eventually doing because he lacked, I think, the moral foundation. But to I want to get at something that I feel like you're hinting at, but you're not saying directly, which is if you don't have a national consensus, you're not going to be able to successfully implement an agenda. And I, and I feel as if the biggest problem with the right right now, Governor DeSantis is facing it in Florida and some of these ideas, is you push an idea that's unpopular and it only creates more divisiveness and you don't even know whether your idea works. Well, here's the thing. I think what's the case for those ideas? I'm pushing, for example, as part of my policy agenda, eliminating affirmative action in America. Every Republican president since Lyndon Johnson could have struck it with the stroke of a pen, including Trump. They didn't do it. Now, I think this can actually be nationally unifying if it's done against the backdrop of restoring meritocracy in our country. You believe this can be done with an executive order? Oh, I know it can be done with an executive order because it was created by an executive order. 11246. And why do you think Donald Trump didn't do it? I know why they didn't do it. I pressed his people on it. They said that was not a political hill they wanted to die on. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the moral foundation. If you're doing it on a principled basis to say this is what it means to be American, to believe in merit, to believe in the unapologetic pursuit of excellence, mm -hmm. to have a strong moral grounding when you're pushing that case, I think you can at once push the agenda that the Republican base, myself included, wants to see pushed even further, but to also do it in a way that galvanizes and unites the country. And I think that's the counterintuitive way how we actually deliver national unity. That's why I'm in this race. The, let me take the affirmative action here a minute. The reason we, we implemented it, it was basically a reparation for Jim Crow. And for uh, because African Americans were denied opportunities that other Americans should have been that they should have had over the last hundred years, and they were denied it. And the point of affirmative. Do you think now you can make the case that somehow everything is level for African Americans? I'm not in this making country? the case that everything's level. I'm making the case that Lyndon Johnson's Great Society has been a disaster for all Americans, especially Black Americans. Okay, seventy plus percent of Black Americans before the Great Society, including affirmative action were born into two-parent households. Mm -hmm. Now it's less than 30% in the other direction. Black economic prosperity in this country is down. So is affirmative action a form of anti-white and anti-Asian racism, and is it anti-meritocratic? Yes, it is, but that's not the only problem. It is actually a form of psychological slavery that has held black Americans back, and which is fueling more anti-black racism in our country. It leaves us even more divided in the end. And even when California shot down Prop 16, what does that tell you? Americans have an anaphylactic reaction against race-based preferences. What you really need is leaders with conviction and courage to say that we can both go further on first principle and unite the country in the process. And that's just an example of the kind of mm -hmm. issue that I'm taking on that no other Republican, either in this race or in history, mm -hmm. has dared to touch. That's a big part of this campaign. Let me go to another couple of issues. I've not heard you on abortion. Where are you on the issue of abortion? 
So I'm pro-life. I picked what is that, that up. All right. But yeah. pro-life is, mean, is meaningless now. So here's what I would say. So it, give it, me your yeah. specifics. So the things that are specific and distinctive about me is I believe in walking the walk when it comes to being pro-life. I actually believe in starting a conversation about the responsibility of men, not mm -hmm. just women, including potentially giving legal teeth to that, where actually men have to potentially take responsibility for a woman that carries, for a woman who has to carry a baby to term that she otherwise wouldn't have wanted to. I think she should actually have the opportunity to force the man in that situation to actually be able to raise that kid. I think it involving adoption laws, involving even child care and support for child care, that's conservatives walk in the walk when it comes to being pro-life. I have been clear that I'm against a federal ban. The reason why is I've long believed on constitutional principles that Roe was wrongly decided that this is a state's rights issue, and I intend to be consistent about that, but that's my position. So here's the thing on this idea of states' rights versus not having sort of federal codification of abortion laws. Should a woman who lives in Louisiana have a different right than a woman who lives in Virginia? That's part of the pluralism of American democracy, is that different states this have is, this is many... A, this is a fundamental... This is a fundamental... Not, not on some basic rights like this. We have a, a, some basic Bill of Rights. So basically, you get different medical care based on where you live? I think democratically, local communities and states having the ability to set their norms on mm -hmm. issues that are not enshrined in the Constitution as powers reserved to Congress is the system that our founding fathers set into motion. So yes, I think that that pluralism is part of what it means to be American. I personally, on that, this is not an issue for right. the president, but, but on a personal level, I am pro-life. 65% of the country did not want to see Roe v. Wade overturned. In fact, they want to see some form of it set into that this should be the national abortion state. 65%, we started our conversation with this issue. Of you need to have, if you want to implement an yeah. agenda successfully, you need to have national consensus. Your abortion position is way out of whack with two-thirds of a country. Here's what do you I'll say? I'll say two things in response yeah. to that. One is there is a process. You can amend the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't support doing that, but if the numbers enshrined in our Constitution wanted to support it, that's how you would make what it a constitutional right. What if Congress codifies right. it? Well, I don't they think... They might. Well, I think that that's Maybe not... Maybe not this one, but the next one. Could. I think there's a good argument that's not within Article One power delegated to Congress. But here's how we can unify... You're asking a more important question. Let's not get into the legal specifics, mm -hmm. though we can go down that rabbit hole if you want. I think the more important question is unifying the country. And here's the other thing. Clarence Thomas asked from the bench during mm -hmm. the Dobbs case, okay? He asked a very fascinating question. There's almost no one in this country who disagrees with it either. That if there's a pregnant woman, she's assaulted, but the baby dies in the process, is there a higher special penalty reserved for the perpetrator? I think most people in this country, in their gut instinct, believe they're deep in their bones, the answer to that question is yes. What does that tell you? What does that tell me? It tells me that most people recognize that this is not just an issue about women's rights, mm -hmm. it has to do with life too. And so what I'm trying to do to unify the country is to actually get in this together, not to say it's men versus women, we're in this together, mm -hmm. have men take more responsibility, have codify that potentially even in a legal regime, and then make it easier for women to get to the place that the pro-life movement wants them to get, including through stepping up for child care, making that easier for women to get to the pro-life position. I think that's actually the way we unify the country because I think there is that intuition in response to that Clarence Thomas mm -hmm. question that I think most of us, if we admit, share in common. But do you think a woman should have to carry a child that she doesn't want to carry? Look, I think that if that's the situation we're in, it's an unfortunate situation where, yes, there is a human life at issue. It should be carried to term, but it shouldn't be done in an acrimonious way where it's a men versus women's issue. We should all take equal responsibility to the fullest extent possible as a society to create the conditions for that happening. That's what it means walk in the walk to me. I understand that, but at equal society, why shouldn't the woman herself have that decision on her own? Why should the rest of society have a say? Because there's still this question of a life at issue. And that's what both sides in this debate made. One, one side wants to, you know, has not historically done a great job of acknowledging the women's versus men asymmetry, mm -hmm. which is what I'm trying to bring into this conversation. Mm -hmm. But the pro-choice movement has consistently rejected the idea this had anything to do with life at all. If you take that answer to that Clarence mm -hmm. Thomas question, the guy who you're going to punish for the unwanted death of a fetus in the case of an assault, that tells you there's an intuition there that we can't ignore in this debate. And I think that that's still a bridgeable divide. And you know what? We can. Here's the other thing, Chuck. We got to take these issues off the table where we would say that this is a litmus test for whether or not you can live in a cohesive democratic body politic. The, there are certain issues that will run right. deep, but I still believe we can be united across them, I, even with those deep-seated divisions. The irony is that whatever anybody thought of Roe v. Wade, it turned out it was holding something together in this country. This was an uncomfortable compromise that everybody seemed to find something both right with and wrong with. You end up taking it away, and look what happened. Well, pre-Roe v. Wade, we actually had a lot of national solidarity coming out of World War II, Chuck, too. So I don't think you can pin the lack of national unity today on the Dobbs decision individually. I think that there are a lot of factors mm -hmm. that are deeper seated than any one issue. I think we're going through this national identity crisis where, forget abortion. You ask most people, what does it even mean to be American today? Mm -hmm. You get a blank stare in response. 
I think that is the heart of our national cancer. And if we can answer that question, what are the principles that set this nation into motion 250 years ago? I think we will discover that most Americans agree on free speech, open debate, self-governance, meritocracy. Maybe they disagree on tax rates. Fine, you can debate that. Maybe even they disagree on abortion. And mm -hmm. that's heated and deep. You can disagree on that, too. But there is a deep-seated commitment to the principles that we can rediscover if we're allowed to start talking openly again. That's what this campaign's about. Two other issues that I feel like are going to be dividing line issues inside the Republican primary. One is this issue with entitlements. Yes. Donald Trump has basically said, don't touch them. Yeah. What do you say? So I have a better way forward where I think both Republicans and Democrats are playing small ball here. Tax increases for the Democrats, how to deal with debt versus Republicans talking about entitlement cuts. I think it's as though both parties have forgotten about GDP growth itself. We've had 4% GDP growth for most of our national history, even 3 plus percent from 1980 to 2000. We're less than 2% today. A core part of my domestic agenda is unshackling the American economy from the demands that constrain the U.S. energy sector to actually putting people back to work, which is one of the biggest impediments to GDP growth today. If GDP growth had been on that trajectory that we were from the late 80s into 2000, we would have 20 plus trillion extra in national assets to work with. Our other problems would be small I, by comparison. You sound like my friend Larry Kudlow. You think you can just grow your way out of this problem? I mean, I say moment, this. I mean, you we really can grow think it out. you could yeah. grow out of the problem without having to raise taxes and without having to do any cuts? I think we live in a moment where, where we can... Where does this magical math come from? Well, I think it comes from a couple components. Unleashing the power of the U.S. energy sector. It's actually yeah. foundational. We've purposefully shot our ability to produce energy in this country, mm -hmm. combine nuclear energy and unleashing fossil fuels. That's a big part of it. And then putting people back to work. I mean, the worker shortage in this country well, is a big input. And immigration can play a role in helping that. I was that. just going to say, the biggest worker shortage problem we have is the, is the essentially, we've, we've shut down immigration in this country over the last 10 years. So that's why I'm unapologetically embracing merit-based immigration in America as part of solving that workforce shortage. We then make it worse by paying people to stay home. And even when we stop paying them, that forms a habit that causes a worker shortage in the country. And then the last piece of this is the Department of Education, actually. Invisible problem here. We subsidize four-year college education for a humanities major or gender studies major in California when somebody who wants to do a two-year or one-year program to be a welder or a carpenter or a builder doesn't get that same mm, subsidy. Those things now exist. You get what I you mean, pay have, for, though. They, but, but this is years of trailing mm -hmm. indicators. So I'm not saying I'm not optimistic. Yeah. Actually, the whole point is I am optimistic. But I think that we live in a moment where we can, with right. good leadership, grow our way out of our problems. It's very likely, though, this primary is not about issues, that it's about personalities. Mm -hmm. um, how do you navigate DeSantis versus Trump? So I navigated by saying that what we really need is a courageous leader. Now, I don't think that the Republican... You don't think the two of them are? I don't think so. Not, certainly not DeSantis. I think that this is two outsiders in this race, I think, is what this is going to come down to. You, you, let's Who see are the other. outsiders? You? Myself and Trump. Yeah, Trump you is not a professional You still view Trump model. as an outsider. Well, I've also said you only get to be an outsider once, but he's at least not a professional politician. DeSantis, you view DeSantis as an outsider? is a professional politician. Well, Absolutely What makes him so? Well, he does what he does to get a news cycle out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So even his actions against BlackRock or Disney... If you actually double click on it, we can go into the details. They had very actually limited effect. But oh, once the attention had Disney actually passed. Disney seemed to outmaneuver him. But we're, of course. We're, we're, we have a report on this and, later. Yeah. And BlackRock also has outmaneuvered him in the same way that Disney has. Mm -hmm. And so ironically, the Republican politician here, the governor, mm -hmm. gets what he wants out of it, which is a Twitter trend and a news cycle. But the company knows just to be patient to weather the storm and they get to have the last laugh in the end. Mm -hmm. And I think that leaves neither his Republican nor Democratic constituents better off for it. I don't think a professional politician gets the job done. I think it is between two outsiders. And I think the Republican base, I can tell you this on firsthand experience, is hungry for a tradition in this party of putting a true outsider in the White House. Now, you get to be an outsider once, and I think I'm doing now what Trump did in 15. We're polling about where Trump was when he came down the escalator. And but so I'm Trump excited moved to take this fast. How, how do you, I, I keep coming back to, Donald Trump is basically, he is, he is I, look, he has had more success keeping his base than I think anybody thought. He, is, he has a track record of losing right now. Why do you think his voters are sticking by him? I think that there hasn't been somebody who has actually shown the spine that they can take the agenda that he represented to the next level. I think people in the America First movement truly believe in putting but America first, not Trump. convince his supporters that yes. you'll do it better yes. than him? Yes, yes. That is the job what for is me he? for what, the next right. year and a half. And, and what will you tell that supporter that he can't do that you can't? What, can, what can't he do anymore? Well, the things that I've pledged to get done, he could have gotten done. Shut down the Department of Education, mm -hmm. reform the administrative state. Actually, you want to talk about solving the fentanyl crisis using the military to get that job done. 
That's something I've pledged to do. Not just building the wall, but using actually the U.S. military to secure the border. These are policies... You may run into legal issues with well, that. Well, actually, actually, we've studied this actually in depth, and I'd love to go into depth with you. I think that that's actually a mistaken conception. Mm -hmm. you know, we've spoken to actually a lot of legal scholars on this, yeah. and we could have a whole episode on that. But even taking on affirmative action, mm -hmm. abandoning the restrictions on the American energy sector, I think these are things that I will be able to take to the next level because we're doing it on principled moral foundation and unite the country in a way that Trump did not. You think it's good... Do you think Trump should be running for president if he has if he's indicted, no matter I think, where he's indicted? I think that is free for his decision to make. And I also think that, look, I'm saying this as somebody who's running against Trump. I view that New York case as a case it's of political... New, all right, yeah, I'm saying, there's, it's there's politicized a Georgia, prosecution. There's a Georgia case, there's a Washington... There's a multiple cases here. I think if the Constitution permits you to run for president of the United States, and mm -hmm. it would in that case, I think that is his decision to make, and he's free to do it. And I'll tell you this, I don't want to win by eliminating the competition. Mm -hmm. I want to win because every voter in this country gets a chance to decide for themselves who actually runs this country. Mm -hmm. You talk about preserving our democracy. You hear this a lot across the political spectrum, including on the left. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what one way is to gut the faith in our democracy is to somehow legally eliminate one of the major candidates from running. It'd be a lot easier for me if he was eliminated. I don't want that. I want it to put it to the voters and win through the front door. You think if Donald Trump's a nominee, he can win? I'm not a political analyst, okay? So I'm here to state my beliefs mm -hmm. and, and run because I think I'm the best suited candidate. But if you thought he could it. win, would you be running? Yeah, I would. Okay. Because I'm running because I believe I'm the best person positioned to unify this country. It isn't some political... I could care less for Republican partisan politics. I'm not a partisan in the sense of the conventional sense of the word. I'm an America first conservative who has a vision for the country. Political parties are the way to do it, but I could care less about the machinery of it. If there were another party you'd, uh, that were viable, you'd join it? Well, I think we live in a two-party system that's codified for a reason. I'm, mm -hmm. and I, I'm an unapologetic Republican, but I don't care about the partisan machinery to say that is it Trump's electability or not? No, I think it's about the best candidates running, leaving it to the voters to decide on principle. That's what I'm doing. Vivek, uh, we've gone about 15 minutes. I know we could go more. Yeah. Uh, I hope to do that down the road. Good to see you. Thank you for coming in and be safe on the trail. Appreciate that, Jack. You Thank you. It. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.